So good afternoon, everybody, um, the audience, those of you who hopefully will watch this um, at some future date, um, uh, and particularly Bernard, Ida, Paul and Richard. Um, thank you for being with us. So you're very welcome to Glencree and what a day to come to Glencree. I have worked here quite a lot over the years and it's not always like this, so I do appreciate it. Um, so people have said many things, but this is a, a conversation, a dialogue um, about the experience of minorities. Um, and it's really an opportunity to get a perspective that we hardly ever hear. And with a complex, conflicted, very difficult past that we have, it is important, we believe at Glencree, and I know that's very much the ethos of the sort of Treaty Generation Descendants Group, which is sort of a joint initiative, to try and shed light on perspectives that aren't heard so much. Uh, and so thank you to these four people for being willing to offer a perspective from their, their personal or family or community uh, as to what was going on and what happened and what was the human impact from that civil, the, sort of the horrors of the Civil War period. Um, so that's really the aim and very much, and Ronan alluded to it, very much in the spirit of fostering understanding, fostering further dialogue and exploration uh, and to advance that long, slow, painful, but very necessary journey towards reconciliation. Um, it is not a political discussion. We're not really going to be trying here at all to sort of unpick he said, he said, she said, you know, the politics of it all. That's not the purpose. It is uh, to humanize, to get a perspective, to shine a light where it's been pretty dark for a long time. Um, so the format will be, I'm going to ask uh, each of our participants to just briefly introduce themselves, one or two minutes, just so that we get a, a sense of who they are. And then we'll go around again and ask them to start saying a, a few things to offer a perspective from their family, their personal journey, their community as to what happened with minorities. Um, and then hopefully it will become a bit more of a free-for-all, as in between you four, you know, feel free to dialogue and discuss and uh, we'll see how we go. It, it is not intended, as Ron said, to have interaction with you as the audience. Um, we'll see how we feel if someone wants to have a question at the end, maybe, but please, this is not a, please don't interject. This is very much a dialogue amongst these four with hopefully minimal input from me, um, so just so that's clear. So, if everyone is comfortable, we've tried to open the window, so I mean, a bit of temperature management, uh, amazingly, it's warm in here for Glencree, so this is, um, um, so I think let's start if that's okay, so we might just go round, so Bernard, please, just a, a little bit about, I mean, who you are, so everyone knows who you are. Right, yeah. thank you, Will. Well, I'm, I'm Bernard Barton, um, I live in Dublin, I'm married to Anne-Marie, we have four children. Um, I spent all my life at the bar, and in 2014, I was appointed to the High Court as a High Court judge. And um, I ended up my career on the bench uh, as head of the Civil Juries Division. So it's been a very privileged um, uh, life, professional life that I've had. Um, but I've lived a lie most of my life in the sense that I've been unable to speak about my identity and my background, so I, I'm grateful to everybody in this room for coming here today and to my friends for making this possible to actually tell a story which has been under the carpet for so long. Thanks, Bernard. Um, I'm Ida Milton. I'm a professional academic historian. Um, for many years, my, the focus of my work was on pandemics, you know, another trauma. And um, <laughs> while that was going on, I also found myself uh, increasingly being asked about my background because I come from something like 400 years of Southern Irish Protestantism. Um, and most of that has been concentrated and focused in Wexford or Carlow, Kilkenny region. My multiple branches of my family come from there and have great experience of things like 1798, uh, the Cromwellian campaigns and things like that as well. And gradually I found people asking me a lot more about that and also found that there was a lot of myth about it and that I needed to, I felt the need to puncture that myth. So I sort of described myself as a historian myth breaker. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, Arnold. 
Bishop so I'm Paul Colton. I'm Bishop of the most southerly diocese of the Church of Ireland, Cork Cloyne of Ross, which is the entirety of County Cork, with a tiny little bit of uh, Waterford. Uh, my father was from Dublin. My mother was from Wexford. Her father was from Armagh. Uh, I describe myself as a true Irish synthesis in that I was born in Derry when my parents were living on the border in Donegal. We moved to Cork when I was three. Uh, but I've expanded in my worldview greatly. Very early on, I uh, took on a European identity in the early 70s. I remember having a postcard when Ireland joined the EEC, I am a child of Europe, and it was over my bed. And that's been very much my worldview uh, uh, ever, ever since. Uh, so yes, a truly Irish synthesis, Dublin, Wexford, who lived in Canada, in Northern Ireland, Dublin and Cork. Thank you, Paul. Richard. Uh, I'm Richard Fawcett. My father comes from a Republican background. His father was an uh, associate of Michael Collins and uh, De Valera and uh, Harry Boland and all of those. Um, he was part of the treaty delegation. Um, uh, my mother's was is Protestant from West Cork. Um, she's from the Connor clan, uh, the old Connor clan. Uh, pro Protestant, uh, resident in Manch, which is between Balneen and Dunmanway. Been there since the sort of like 1500s. Um, so I'm from two backgrounds. One background is you know highly Republican. The other background is pr principally Protestant, um, agrarian reform. Uh, uh, United Irishman, that sort of background. I've been living in England for 32 years. I'm married to Petra. I have uh, three children, two boys and a girl. Um, and uh, over the last few years, I've just been supporting a number of people in, in coming together about uh, you know, our shared history on the treaty side. Prior, prior to that, I was really focused on the United Irishman. Um, as a as a topic of my Protestant background, but I'm as Paul. I'm a hybrid. Um, I, I think uh, hopefully you, you we will bring something to the table today that you yeah, haven't heard before. <laughs> no doubt, <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> all of you will bring something to the table. Um, so, if okay, Bernard, if we could start with you. Um, right. Well, just um, in your own time. No, no rush. Um, just what sort of perspective would you like to share and offer? To, uh... All right. Thank, thank you, Bill. Well, um, uh, I, I, I come from an Anglo-Irish background um, and uh, very definitely what you might describe as West Brit or what we were just, would have been described as, as, as West Brits, um, Southern Unionist um, supporters, um, and uh, I, I suppose um, the one person in the, in the larger family whom perhaps the public would know about was Robert Barton, uh, who signed the treaty, who helped the negotiation sign the treaty, although he subsequently uh, rejected that. But um, my fascination really um, with him arose literally from childhood. Um, because I used to go and play, my grandfather was friendly with Robert, but they were definitely on opposite sides, I think, politically. Um, and, but I used to go and play there. And people often say to me, oh, what did Robert Barton say to you? <laughs> of course, those were the days of being seen and not heard. We would just say hello. And then, in fact, there's a fabulous water, like an Alice in Wonderland yeah. garden in Animo Estate. And myself and my brother and my cousins, oh, oh, Thank you, Brian. We just wanted to get out and play in the garden. So, um, but I do remember sort of growing up, um, becoming aware of the fact that I was different from my friends. Most of the family, nearly all the family in Ireland are Anglican, but not, not of my particular family actually happened to be RC. So my awareness of that there was something different about me really only came to light as I, as I was growing up, nine, eight, nine, ten, or that there was something different between me and maybe my, 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 my friends at school. <coughs> so being a Catholic, we were sent to Catholic schools. Um, we actually ended up, we lived in Dublin in St. Michael's. 
uh, Holy Ghost. But my friends, my fa my parents' friends, a, a lot of them were, were Protestants, and I had Protestant friends, and I was a no, Protestant Boy Scout <laughs> thing. So I had this kind of living in a sort of a dual uh, existence, but I, I didn't wasn't conscious of any sort of difference between us. Um, my, 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 my classmates, my friends, um, um, but um, at around about nine, I was nine, I think, and the event which brought this consciousness, uh, or I became conscious of, of a separate identity, was um, the wedding of Princess Margaret. Now, I never re thought for a moment that the wedding of Princess Margaret was actually going to have such a traumatic impact on my life, but it did. And when I went to school the next day, um, the teacher, who was a recently returned uh, priest from, he'd been in Nigeria, I think, and he's a missionary priest, and he came back from that. Uh, God only knows what sort of experience he had out there, but there was no doubting his nationalist fervor. And he was asking me, you know, where were you yesterday? Why were you not at school? Well, in total innocence, I said to him, uh, well, I was... I was watching the, the wedding of Princess Margaret, and he, he, the man flew into a rage. He just couldn't believe that this has actually happened. <laughs> um, and he, he got really upset. And he brought me up to the top of the class, and he gave the class a lecture. Now, corporal punishment was, you know, de rigueur in those days. I mean, so being hit at school was not something that I would actually think much about, because it, it, happened, it happened to me on a, on a regular basis, <laughs> all too regular. But the punishment that was meted out to me on that occasion is something I will never forget. Because he decided to make an example of me and told my classmates he was going to make an example of me. He said it was this West British behaviour amongst Irish people who had kept Ireland enslaved for 800 years. He put my hand on his desk and he brought a ruler down on it, the edge of the ruler. I can still feel the pain today. Uh, on both on both hands. Um, of course, when we went into the school yard to play, uh, my friends, of course, West Brit, West Brit, and I'd never heard this term before. I didn't know what this meant. I didn't know. I, it, it, I couldn't understand. I knew they were teasing me, or at least I thought they were teasing me. And uh, so I went home to my mother, who was an art unionist, and <laughs> they said, "Mummy, um, you know, the boys are, are calling me a West Brit at school. What, what, what's all this about?" And she, she said, don't mind them, they're only too easy, and you'd be proud of that. <laughs> so I said, all right, so there's nothing wrong with this, because your mother is sort of telling you that there's nothing wrong with this. But um, so that was the first sort of realisation, oh, I'm not quite the same as everybody else. And, uh, and that was it, there was nothing further with the priest or anything like that. But about the same year, my grandfather, with whom I'm terribly close, that's a, I brought this little, this little photograph of him. Um, this is him during the First World War. He was an officer in the cavalry officer in the 5th Yorkshire Dragoon Guards. And I adored, I adored the ground he walked on. And <laughs> anyway, he was great um, in terms of bringing his grandchildren. He was a really good grandfather. And, but uh, he would regularly take us for walks. But just to give you a little flavour of this, I, I, never, I never heard of Don Leary. We were always taken for walks in Kingstown. And, uh, you know, Christmas lunch was always preceded by a, 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 the, the Queen's speech. And um, at church on a Sunday going to Mass, he'd always say a prayer for the Queen. So, uh, oh, he's an Irish citizen, and that's, but this link was very important to him. But he took us for a walk, and he thought we were of an age, myself and my brother, took us for a walk to um, the Island Bridge, the war, the Lutchens, the famous Lutchens War Memorial to the dead, to the Irish dead of the Great War. And we were, it was a ruin. I mean, it was a dump. It was, it was unbelievable. It was overgrown and there was rubbish strewn everywhere. And it, this was the first time, because we were, grown, we were brought up in uh, an age of boys don't cry, and certainly men don't cry. And I saw a tear welling up in my grandfather's eye. And um, I remember saying to him, what's wrong around that? And he, was, he became quite emotional and he said, this is the way our country remembers the sacrifice that me and your grandfather and so many other people 
made so that we'd be free, uh, that we would have a democratic. Uh, and this is how the country remembers. And I, I don't, it had a huge, profound effect on me because he was so upset. And um, so there was nothing, that was, that was it. So that these are little stepping stones to a consciousness about really who you are, where you came from. And then a little bit in early teens, I, I remember a family, a family discussion where my grandmother and my grandfather and her brothers, I think, they were all at a table and we were still the scene and not her, but it got very fractious. And this was the first time I'd ever heard really of anybody saying anything about Robert Barton's political thing. And my, my grandfather said, I think more to tease his brothers-in-law who had been on opposite sides of the Civil War. <laughs> I think he said, I can never understand, he said, what possessed Robert to become a shinner? This is this. <laughs> and my grandmother could see this was going to cause <laughs> eruptions at the table. And she decided to, just to stop this. And she interjected to simply say, well, now Oswald, my grandfather was <laughs> Oswald, Oswald. Perhaps he realized which way the wind was blowing. After all, he had a two and a half thousand acre estate. <laughs> and there were a lot of promises to distribute land. Anyway, that diffused the, 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 the situation. Um, and uh, I suppose then the next, the next event, which I'd like to share with you all, was the 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 the, um, the 50th anniversary of the rebellion. Now, in my house, it was always the rebellion that <laughs> we never used the word the rising. They used, you know, my grandfather. There was no rising. <laughs> as far as he was concerned, this was a rebellion against uh, the, the lawful, um, the established state and for which he was fighting in the trenches. And he, as it happens, at the time of the rebellion, he was home on leave. He'd been gassed in the trenches, so he was actually quite ill. And he had a sister, uh, he's a sister living in, our, in Dublin. So he came home to visit his sister and was playing uh, tennis in Mount Merion when he got uh, a telegram to say he had to get in, he had to answer the call. They were all called up, everybody was called up, even if they were off duty. And so in, in class just before Easter, my, my history teacher, Irish teacher said to me, he says, boys, I want you to go home and find out, you know, where your grandfather was in 1916. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I knew because this, this picture actually was beside his, 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 a table that he used to sit in. So I grew up with this picture all my life, and I sort of had this vision of my granddad. Yes, I knew. I said, he's in the uniform. Oh, yes, he must have been there. He's so great. So I went home. I said, Granddad, um, uh, Mr. Walsh wants to know, um, you know, were you in 1916? And he said, oh, yes, I was. And so he proceeded to tell me the story. So I'm delighted with this. I go back to school. The innocence now of this, I go back to school. I'm thrilled to be able to say that my grandfather was in the thick of it. So, um, the first chap up was a fellow called Barry, and apparently his grandfather had had, had held up the post office in Mitchellstown or something. So I wasn't <laughs> the, the, the one terrible amount of excitement until eventually it came to my turn. We were going to be doing this in alphabetical order. So I got up across the class anyway, and I said, "My granddad was in 1916. Where was he?" Said Mr. Walsh, "In Dublin." Dublin. He said, "Stop, boys!" He says, "Boys!" He said, "He said." Bernard's grandfather was in the crucible of the revolution. You know, that's what I'm <laughs> continue, he says. So I continued along like this. So everything was going fine until told about the telegram and all this uh, until I mentioned Trinity College. So so the teacher the teacher said to me, Trinity College, are you sure it wasn't the GPO? And I said, No, he didn't mention the GPO. Uh, Boland's Mills? No. The Mendicity Institution? No. The Royal College of Surgeons? No. Trinity College. So the teacher just couldn't get a, get a hand of it. He said, there must, that must be a mistake. But of course, as I said, I adored the man. So I said, Does, you, now, in those days, you wouldn't take off a teacher. But like if my granddad said he was in Trinity College, that was it. So Mr. Walsh basically gave up trying to convince me to change my story and accept that I made a mistake. And he said, but, but, but the British were in Trinity College. And I said, well, I, I know that. I said, well, what was he doing there? Oh, he said, he told me to tell you he was putting down the rebels. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, or he's helping to put down the rebels. So that's kind of, that's the sort of, 
that's the kind of background. But um, and, and that's I, I think you, you all agree, obviously, by the reaction that it's kind of a, a witty story. But it 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 was this understanding that there was something different, and. Uh, I, I know that a lot of my Protestant friends, because listening to them talking, how they became aware that they were Protestant, and in some way that they were different. But I have to say, I was always, as a barrister, as a struggling barrister, I was delighted for people to be under the impression that I was A, a direct descendant of Robert Barton, and B, so I was on the right side of the whole thing, and B, that I was astound, sound, sound religiously kicked with the right foot, that <laughs> I was an Anglican. and. Um, uh, and, and, and was briefed on that basis. Uh, and the former Archbishop of Dublin, uh, whom Paul will know, know of, his son was a very, it was a leading member of the inner bar. And he did his best to make sure that his um, connections, shall we say, in the Church of Ireland community, in the solicitors, would brief the right people. You know, he was a great man for supporting the, So I got an opportunity to represent a uh, a, a defendant in the case that he was acting for him. And he called me over and said, Bart, come over here. I was going to say, Are you doing anything today? What, in the Irish Times? And said, no. I said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm act I actually happens, I'm, I'm actually free. Good, he said, you've got the junior brief in this case. And uh, in those days I used to read the uh, law reports, the weekly law reports. And the issue in the case was about nervous shock. And this was new in Ireland, but I knew what it was. I excused myself, went back to the library, book, and I said, oh, um, David, I think this is what you're looking for. And this helped settle the case. And so coming back in from the law library, to, uh, to the law library from the forecourt, he said to me, wonderful. You made a great contribution today. So he said, I, I, I've told Mr. Wong uh, about your contribution. Mr. Wong was the general manager of the Sun Alliance Insurance Company. So later on that afternoon, I thought, oh yeah. Later on that afternoon, um, uh, a man appeared outside the law library and asked for me to be called. I was called and I came out and I didn't recognize anybody except this one individual standing outside. I said, did you by any chance call me? He said, oh yes, I've been sent down here by Mr. Wan. He wants to know if you'd like to join the barrister's panel of the Royal and Lines Insurance Company. So the rest is history. Um, and uh, the following September, um, after religious services, so the different denominations have religious, for the opening of the law term, I was summoned by David Butler, who had this huge, this man now who had done so much to uh, um, promote my career at the bar, called me over and said, come over here. So <laughs> I walked over to him and he was talking to <coughs> Declan, Declan Bodd, Another fellow religionist and very senior counsel says, "But here tells me you're not one of us." <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so um, yeah. So, uh, and, and, and that, that that November, I wore a poppy into the law library uh, just to assure him that I wasn't actually quite a renegade, and and others, and but put up against a wall by a very senior member of the bar who wanted to know what I was wearing that thing for. And so that, you know, the bar, the, the law library, the law society, the bar council, there was a huge number of barristers killed in the First World War and solicitors, and there was no ceremony, there was no marking this event, nothing. And um, I, I remember thinking how awful this was. I couldn't believe that that we were wanting to bury this and say nothing about it. And so all of the story I've told you was feeding into this as I became an adult. And um, I made it my business that we were going to remember these people. And um, I was involved in the Fine Gael party at the time. And um, I remember uh, Paddy Hart coming into the doll and throwing poppies on the floor of the doll and saying to people, I dare you to pick one up. And it caused a huge, at the time, it caused a huge, you know, it, but this was 1984 now. And he made this amazing speech. Well, it was amazing for me. He, said, he told it all. He said, you know, what sort of a republic have we got here? He said, these are our people. They came from every parish in the country. And it's time for us to reclaim them. And this is 1984. And it took... It took until the presidential election of 1990 for this to change. 
uh, Paddy Hillary had refused to go, I don't attend services in, the, to, uh, in, in, in memorial of foreign armies. And Mary Robinson was asked at a, at a, um, on a television program, first question, if you become president, uh, the day after your election will be remembrance service in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Will you go to that? They were all asked the same question. They all gave what we've come to realise a waffly answer, except Mary Robinson said, if I'm elected, that will be my, for it'll be my privilege to do, to do that. And um, it, start, it kind of started from there, of course, all the presidents. So there's been a great, there has been a great change, but I think the fact that, and Ronan referred to this, the Unionists, the Southern Unionists, didn't disappear. They just went into hiding in terms of their identity. They had to. It was a case of survival. And, uh, and my own family, lots of my own family, that's, that's what they did. I did it myself. I, I just said, I'm not talking about my, my identity or my background in public at all, ever. And that's when I say I lived a lie. That's what I mean. And I, but I suppose being a constitutional historian and that I've, I've and, and the unfinished business of, of, Nor of, 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 of our island, um, you know, has really, and then the, 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 the book, coming together for the book, really gave me the courage to, to come out and basically say, well, listen, look, there is another, there is another Bernard Barton and there are loads of Bernard Bartons um, and in this country. And if we're ever going to have an, an agreed Ireland, a shared Ireland, then we're going to have to start again. And the new Ireland is going to be one in which, as the Good Friday Agreement itself says, all the traditions and identity on this island will share equally. Parity of esteem is the great. Is the great. And that's sadly what's missing in the two states that were set up here um, in 1920 and 22. Parity of esteem just went out the windows. We know what happened in the north. But, the, but what we probably are not conscious of, and I think most people in the South are not conscious of it, Southern Unionists backed Home Rule. They, they backed the proposals that came out of the convention in 1917. No one's ever heard of this. They're very different from their uh, co-unionists uh, in the North. Um, and they wanted a place. And to be fair, to, in the early days, that a lot of them were appointed into the Senate, but of course they were picked out for burning and shooting, uh, pr principally because of that. And I'm going to finish with this, um, on this part, I've probably gone on for far too long, but just um, people think, and it's being repeated today on the media, that the, the treaty delegation were threatened and that they signed that, page, that treaty under duress of immediate and terrible war. The language in the debates, for anybody who's read it, was absolutely shocking about West Brits. You know, even the pro-treaty TDs were saying, this gives us the independence. And there are, there are unfortunate phrases there where you'll get rid of the West Brits, talking about my people, my family. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we'd be rid of the unionists, we'd be rid of them. I mean, there was, it was very emotional, very strong stuff. And, you could say hateful, um, but of course there was this ideal of creating a new Celtic Ireland. There was no place for a, a, a pro-British or West Brit identity in this new island. And the same thing happened in the north. But what people maybe are not aware of, it happened down here, but because the minority was so small, it really was, it was kind of, it was a different kind of a minority as well. It was really, it was hidden. And, and so everybody's and tried to think the parity of esteem as encompassed in the Good Friday is something for Northern Ireland, but actually it's something which we need down here. I mean, what are the tangible, tangible examples of the state showing parity of esteem to a different, the British Irish identity on this island? Well, I mean, there's just no, it's hard to, oh, the president goes to the remembrance service, that's kind of about it. It's not, it's not an issue, but uh, so as I say, that's that's anyway that was that my life. But I had to hide it. Uh, I don't know what success I would have made in my career if I had gone. You know, uh, it was necessary. And I'm kind of thinking that in 
in the future, in whatever new Ireland we might agree, it won't be necessary for anybody to go into hiding. That if you're, if you're, if you were uh, of the unionist tradition or you're of the republican nationalist tradition, everybody will respect everyone else, and we'll we'll learn to live and share this land which we all love. So I think the failures of the two states, in terms of their minorities, is something that is a valuable historical lesson to be learned from that and to be avoided in whatever we construct in the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Bernard, very much. <clears throat> thank you, and thanks for, I mean, just having the courage and the heartfelt nature which you've shared that. So that's a really powerful, yeah. Um, Ida, please, if you'd like to... Mm, it's very difficult to follow that. <laughs> You've set some act, some standard there. Um, you know, I was thinking constantly of the contrast between our lives that were ant antipathic, you know, completely. Um, I was raised in um, a household that was quite consciously culturally nationalist and no way would have been supporters of the IRA or anything like that, but would have come through the Irish Parliamentary Party, come in a Gael, Fine Gael, and a sort of, I'd like to call it nationalism with a very small N. And I went to Irish dancing. I was absolutely terrible at it. Uh, my sister was far better. And my granny used to give me medals for reading instead. So my poor little ego wasn't so bashed. Um, my, gran my father and myself would often go to Croke Park when we, I was six, seven, eight years of age. Uh, we're from Wexford. So Wexford, we were doing really well in that era. And uh, I loved that because my brother, older brother, was much more into soccer because, of course, this was the era of Georgie Best and English soccer coming onto the television. And he was going around with his lovely Georgie Best haircut. And um, uh, I, on the other hand, identified with my father. And this was a way Daddy and I could have special time. We went off to Croke Park together. It was really lovely. And then when you're talking about the 50th anniversary, I'm thinking, oh, my God, what a contrast we have here, because I was six. I was born in 1960. And when in my very small St. Eden's National School, Church of Ireland School, in Ferns, when the proclamation, you know, that one that went up on the walls for all the national schools, when that came in, I, my Irish was very good at six. I was a little bit precocious, uh, lost it since. <laughs> and, uh, um, they said, would you like to haul, pull it up and read it? So I did. And I read it off scale again, pulled it up onto the wall and, you know, stood very solemnly and probably even with a little salute as I was doing it. And at that stage, I was marching around uh, with a little toy um, rifle that my father had made over my shoulder singing the Jolly Plowboy. Never thinking that anybody would think this was a bit of an odd thing for a little Protestant girl from Wexford, the descendant of Cromwellians, to be doing. <laughs> and uh, so it was, it, was, it was a very different sort of upbringing. And my parents, my mother had uh, gone to university, which was you know, quite something for a woman of her generation. She'd won a county council scholarship, the first female and the first um, Protestant from Wexford. And she was actually put in for it by the local schoolmaster from the Catholic school, who did it secretly because he knew her father would be far too modest to let her put in for it. And she won the award. And from that, she became a teacher. And she and my father both had taught very deeply about um, their nationalism and engaged very much with Ireland. And it was quite a surprise to me when I moved out and started going to, first of all, um, Rathmines College of Commerce, where I studied journalism, and then, you know, living a life in Dublin, that people thought that they'd start imposing values on you, and saying, oh, you're a unionist. And I said, no. And particularly at that stage, we were, you know, talking 70s, 80s. And the values, because Southern uh, Protestants were so very quiet, and really didn't like people talking out. To this day, I don't think they probably like people like you and I talking out all that much, Paul. But um, um, with certain sectors don't. And um, that the, a lot of people have never <clears throat> met a Protestant. And I remember, you know, in my group in Rathmines, there was about 20 of us. And uh, one of them said to me one day at, you know, some kind of drinks somewhere around the place, said, uh, can I kiss you? And I said, Okay. And uh, he said, I've never kissed a Protestant before. <laughs> and this really set me thinking, you know, if I hadn't been thinking already about identity and who I was and how in my community, and I don't just mean within the religious community in Ferns, the place I grew up, um, 
that one who I was was normal. It was just, we were Protestants. We went to a different church. That's all it meant. We still played GA. Um, I didn't play, but I watched. We had a GA pitch on the land. Uh, my father tried and he was equally cack-handed like I was, but he loved it. And, um, you know, it was, it was normal within Wexford. And actually, even during this week, I've been thinking a lot more about that and thinking that maybe um, Wexford had learned from 1798, that there was bitterness there. Mm -hmm. There were things, as my father, who was a 1798 historian, would say, that happened in the heat of war. And um, he didn't see them as sectarian as such, while other people might see them as sectarian or interpret them. There are different events in history that we can interpret in different ways. And I think we need to not interpret them in binary ways. That, that, that's really important. But I also think Wexford is a really good example because we memorialize in a different way. And each time there has been a bicentenary or a centenary of 1798, uh, local communities have been very keen to be inclusive and to be respectful. And that happened with the first hundred years and it certainly happened with the second hundred years uh, centenary. And my father, who was on the committee for that, said it, if, if, and this is really interesting, he said, if we had put as much work into that, he was on the committee, and he said, we might have won. <laughs> And I don't think he meant the British. <laughs> but we did have family land that was run over uh, the Elms land in South Wexford. It was right beside Carrickburn Hill. Um, not a hair in any of our heads was destroyed. We were uh, uh, evacuated from the farms and protected by what's never said, but it had to be our local Catholic neighbours. Yeah. And right across time, I can see countless uh, examples of kindness to us in times of stress. And that was a reason why I was very anxious to write with my great colleague, Ian Dalton, uh, the book we, uh, collection we did, um, Protestant and Irish, which is a collection of essays about people who try to assimilate in some ways into the New Ireland. And we were not looking at the West Cork situation or other uh, things, because other people have written about those. We wanted to write about um, the druk ulk gets a lot of attention, the bad word. And we wanted to write about interesting things and positive engagement and to portray that because I do think there you will come across um, what would you call it a kind of a casual in the same way that you got the West Brit thrown at you we get that thrown you know Protestants are all landlords and of course when you don't know Protestants you think they're all landlords <laughs> you know? or that all landlords are bad even yeah. for that matter some landlords were very good um, so you know that, that I do think we needed to gradually start to expose ourselves and particularly in the light of the new political situation or that will come inevitably and that the more information, the more understanding we have of who we all are, um, the better for that. And that was particularly important to me with Protestant and Irish, that it would be a positive engagement and telling not smarmy, sweet stories, but, you know, positive engagement. For example, my, my article in it is about, you know, our family playing Gaelic games. And to go back to a point I was trying to make and didn't fully finish earlier is that I feel that um, in Waxford we learned from 1798 and that there was, um, I can see evidence of it between conversations in 1914 when this rush to the volunteers in Waxford and the local leaders of the volunteers. And they're all families I know to this day. Uh, went to the Church of Ireland Bishop of uh, Ferns, the Church of Ireland Dean of Ferns, and the local leading Quaker, Jeremiah Houghton, and they said, look, you know, we're using this money and this thing to, to buy arms and to arm up and to train, but it is not 1798. It's never going to go back to that. This is not anti-Protestant, uh, whereas something else was happening in the North, a different situation. But they were very consciously reaching out to local communities. And I, I find that fascinating. I think that that Wexford um, and the good neighbourliness that was shown there and the f willingness to commemorate in a certain way was really helpful to the really lovely society that I grew up in, where even as a Protestant child, you'd walk through a doorway and you'd get a duck egg cooked for yourself in any house, the same as, you know, the other children would. And um, I'll leave it there then. Thanks. Well done. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Paul. Well, I just said something there about us talking and people not liking us talking. And my overriding feeling coming here today was, I'm not sure that my ancestors would want me to be here at all. <laughs> Um, and that is indicative of something. Uh, they didn't talk about it themselves. My grandparents didn't. Um, my aunts didn't. My father was slightly different. Uh, I'll say a bit more about him later. But the, the overriding feeling as someone also born in, the 19th, in 1960, as I was um, visiting family in Dublin and Wexford, from Cork in the 1960s and early 1970s, in relation to all of this, actually was silence and nothingness. They simply just got on with life, being who they were and what they were. It was pretty self-contained. Uh, they weren't politically engaged. Um, they just got on with it. And it's only when I had to clear out my late aunt's house in the early 1990s, I was her executor, that I discovered hidden history in shoeboxes and things. Um, and um, it was only then that I began to do some detective work and managed to piece together the family story uh, that they hadn't talked about. Um, birth certs from the mid-19th century, from the East End of London. Great-great-grandfathers, one who was a butcher, one who was a carpenter. Very big families, 10, 11, 12 siblings, uh, in places like uh, Poplar, Bethnal Green, West Ham, all those places. Um, actually, last October 12 months, Susan and I went back on a pilgrimage, a strange sort of pilgrimage. We decided to visit all the fonts in which they were baptised. Um, because fonts, by and large, don't get moved in churches. Yeah. Whereas if you go to the churches they married in, where did they stand? Where did it happen? But the font is the font. That's an aside. So, a very different world from Barnard's, a very different world from Ida's. Um, East End, on the Colton side, East End poverty. East End poverty. And on my grandmother's side, Balbriggan, again, carpentry. Early death and her mother's move as a caretaker they lived, she and her brother and her mother, a widow, a young widow, they were in an attic on Westland Row in a building on which she was caretaker. They had previously lived somewhere on Clanbrassel Street with friends when they were effectively homeless. And then on my mother's side, uh, uh, Church of Ireland in Wexford, Tan, uh, her mother, and then her father, rural South Armagh, uh, leaving the farm to become a draper's apprentice and migrating progressively southwards until eventually ending up um, as a draper's assistant in Wexford and then eventually uh, having a shop, which by the time I was on the scene, uh, was known as Wexford's largest department store. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a journey southwards and upwards on my mother's side. They were Presbyterians. And my mother married a Presbyterian, so uh, he, my father married a Presbyterian, so uh, there was a, he always used to say, you know, he, he would say, Roman Catholics don't understand this, but I'm in an interchurch marriage too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a new to church marriage too. And we had, we had this, thing, this, this thing about when we were in Cork, we went to the Church of Ireland. And then, like uh, Her Mad Late Majesty the Queen in Scotland, when we went to Wexford, we became Presbyterians <laughs> and attended the Presbyterian Church interchangeably, which had been sustained from the 1920s. So uh, by, by my mother's family, uh, um, all of those people... Um, 
all of those, that grandfather, um, of course, came southwards prior to independence. So they were, you know, they were making this transition. The Coltons joined the army, I feel very comfortable in this setting. <laughs> and uh, the Coltons joined the army. My, my grandfather, great-grandfather at the age of 18, signed up in 1882 for the Commissariat and Transport Corps. Now, when you're young and you discover you've great-grandfathers and grandfathers in the army, you love to think that they were all colonels, brigadiers, and field marshals. <laughs> My great-grandfather was a groom was a groom. Um, and as I looked back through the uh, family story, right up to my father, um, until the post Second World War period, their addresses were at the different barracks in Dublin. Wellington, Richmond, Portobello. I was already looking the other day at my grandfather's sister's wedding certificate. February 1920, and her address was Beggar's Bush Barracks. Her father, Samuel Henry Colton, the one who'd come from the East End of London, his job was down as Barracks Warden. And the man she married was from the 1st Dorsetshire Regiment, and his home address was Ebrington Barracks, Londonderry. And I thought to myself, two years after that, that household became homeless from Beggar's Bush Barracks. I don't know where they went in 1922-23. I don't know where they went. Haven't found that out yet. Um, I do know that my grandfather, who married the widow's daughter living on Western Row, that they ended up in houses in Kingstown, Dunleary, at a place called, for Protestants, a very unusual name, Rosary Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> still there. It's still there, and I've been to see Rosary Gardens because they were owned, I think, as sort of grace and favour houses for retired army people. Um, so it was all very modest. It was, I won't say it was poor. They wouldn't have described themselves as poor. It was modest. Um, I'm the first person, the first male in the Culleton family to complete a second level education. And that's because it was free. <laughs> and I'm, of course, I'm, you thought I was going to say the first one to do a third level education, but I am the first of any to do a third, uh, uh, get a university education. Um, my father's education at St Andrews was stymied by lack of money and he had to leave in second year. So that gives you a flavour of the provenance. And um, I looked at the census of 1911 and how uh, the Coltons were. Then they were in Ship Street Barracks in 1911 living there, he was a groom. And even in 1911, the Church of Ireland having been disestablished in 1870, and he having been in Ireland since 1882, as late as 1911, they were all describing themselves as Church of England. On that said, Sister Clare. And it's quite clear under the column Irish language that you were either to put Irish or Irish and English or leave it blank. So I was trying to figure out whether it was a political statement or something dogged or what, that they wrote indeterminately English under the heading Irish language. I don't know, it's only guesswork. So I have these boxes of two boxes. I should say, by the way, that among them all, the most poignant of them all is uh, are a complete set of postcards of correspondence, very private, from my grandmother's first husband. He was from Usher's Key, a family of about seven. And he was in the 9th in the Skillings, 36th Division. And the postcards were also with uh, 
his medals and um, lots of Belgian and French lace handkerchiefs. Um, he and my grandmother married in St. Mark's on what was Great Brunswick Street, now Pierce Street. Uh, and a year later he was killed at Cambrai on the 17th of November, 19... 20th of November, 1917. My grandmother never mentioned him. My grandfather never mentioned him. My aunt never mentioned him. This was shoebox stuff. My grandfather's stuff from his time in the army, he was in the Army Ordnance Corps later, the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. Um, all his stuff was in boxes. He never spoke about it once, once, I think when I was about eight. He'd been stationed in what was German East Africa and there was a photograph of him there holding a big bunch of bananas. <laughs> And um, once he, um, he said to me, uh, he was very pragmatic about life, and there was this tiny little bedroom in the house after my grandmother died. This was the house in South Dublin, near Black Rock. And um, he said, uh, of course, when I kick the bucket, this room will be yours. You see? <laughs> and, and he said, and by the way, if you're ever in Africa, knock out your boots in the morning in case something has crawled into your boots <laughs> during the night. And sure enough, in 1984, I spent four months in Sudan and Kenya, and I knocked out my boots <laughs> in the morning. Um, so yes, Daniel Griffith, he was a carter in Guinness's. He's in the Guinness list of war dead. Uh, Usher's key, um, never mentioned. I assume... I can only make deductions about the fact that he was in the mind in the ceilings of 36 Ulster Division, that he had orange sympathies and so on, and joined where he felt an affinity. But that's all assumption on my part, because it was silence. What I do know, because when I cleared out the house, I discovered that my grandmother and my two aunts were in the Orange Order in Dublin. I didn't know that. Um, I asked my father, who was still surviving, and he said, oh, yes, we didn't talk about that. We disagreed about that. And I said, well, what am I to do with all these minute books and everything? And I looked at the minutes. I didn't want to be too prurient about it. It wasn't mine, but, you know, the minutes were right up to the 19, late 1950s ending, God Save the Queen, God Save the King, right up to the minute books. And I'd, I only discovered about 15 years, I knew my grandfather had been in the Orange Order and in the Black Preceptory, but he didn't, I knew that he, there was one story, I knew he didn't have an affinity with orange men in the North because they'd gone once off on the 12th of July and somebody had rushed out of a side street and shoved a dagger through their big drum and they didn't like it and they possibly, you know, this isn't us either. You know, uh, so I thought that was interesting. But I only discovered about 15 years ago that there's a room named after my grandfather, the Colton Room, in the Orange Lodge in Dublin. I never knew that. My father never knew that. So this silence and this whole thing. Um, so what would I want to say? Um, uh, that's, I would want to say that we grew up in a world of acquiescence in it all. I mean, there were lots of photographs of my grandfather in the LDF during the emergency. So he transferred his military expertise and in the Monkstown area was district adjutant. And we still have on our sitting room wall a Paul Henry print, which was presented to Samuel Henry Colton by his colleagues in the LDF. So somehow they had acquiesced and had disposed something of the new Ireland that they had transitioned into, but yet had been resentful of the fact of not really having got it. It was often said in the family that my grandmother wouldn't go with him, the one from Balbriggan, wouldn't go with him to England. So he stayed and was disadvantaged because he didn't have Irish, but that he worked in the Land Commission then until retirement. Um, my own, I just, I know I'm talking a lot, but just to finish up, you know, my own, um, I was talking to Susan, my wife, I didn't mention Susan earlier, 
she's recently retired after 41 years as a school teacher, deputy principal and principal. And um, I remember too the 50th anniversary and the, I remember the teacher putting up the crepe paper gold and five being or in it, as the closest you could get, and, uh, and the alcove in which it was erected. I remember all of that. It was dutiful, it was positive, it was engaged in 1966 in the Church of Ireland School in Douglas and Cork. We, you know, but at the same time, five years later, I was in Cork Grammar School and a black and white television, I think it was five, maybe seven or eight years later, and a black and white television was hired in so the whole school could watch the marriage of Princess Anne. <laughs> you know, so uh, that sticks out, sticks out a bit. But we, uh, I was talking to Susan about all of this, and she said, "Really, our whole lives in the '60s and early '70s centered on church and school. We kept to ourselves by large, other than when we were playing on the street, and then we were invited into friends' houses. And it was in friends' houses that we discovered difference, because at six o'clock they'd say the rosary, and hey, what's this?" You know, you know, we don't do that. Why do you do that? You know, that sort of thing. And so it was a world of encountering difference. And that for me became an impulse actually towards curiosity and eventually towards ecumenism and doing a degree at the Irish School of Ecumenics in my 20s and all of that. You know, so those childhood impulses went, went that way. But it was about you know, we danced with other Protestants. We had nothing to do with the GAA. Uh, we, uh, we went to Protestant. We played hockey with Protestants. We played table tennis with Protestants. There was a Protestant table tennis league. There was a Protestant band. League. Now, if I my sons, their jaws would drop listening to me saying this now, because it's such a world totally foreign to their generation. And Protestant hops, which all were of that. And your your rector had to sign a card to allow you to get in. But you see, this was all post natemory fear and isolationism. <laughs> Perhaps enough for now. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard. Oh, my goodness. Please. Why am I last? I'm After sorry. all these. The crazy. They, well, I don't but know. But we know you have uh, plenty of interesting things <laughs> to say. <laughs> so, so uh, oh, there's a couple of things that I take from Paul um, but, uh, and from Bernard and from yourself. I, it, I, I do, is that you know we have this really long history and um, and we we find that you know people are flip flopping in and out of identity you know, um, you know the, your the history of 1798 and and the the actual horror that went on there with pikemen killing people on bridges and things you know double piking uh, that that that. That creates a, 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 a resonance in, in, in your community. And, um, and similarly, uh, Bernard, your grandfather going to the trenches. My grandfather went to the trenches as well, uh, and lots of their friends did. And they went there in, they went there to get home rule, really. They thought, if we go and we do this war, when we come back, we'll have home rule. And they were all Redmanites and you know, home rulers and all the rest of it. And, and the Connor family, they were very much about um, agrarian reform. They're very much about democracy. They were very much about a parliament in Dublin. Uh, and uh, so you know, the, when my grandfather came back from the war, um, he went into the Free State Army. He transferred across. He, he went to the trenches originally. Um, then, he then he joined the RFC. Uh, to, and the flying corps which was going around in tiny little biplanes with an engine behind and a hand grenade and a pistol flying over the trenches. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so he came back uh, to a different world uh, and he transferred into the Free State Army, was a, he became a legal officer. He was one of the lucky barristers who didn't die in the first war. Um, uh, so he would have been on the wall uh, 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 up in Dublin if, if he had. Um, so, so that family, um, you know, they did a, a lot. And if we go back to your point about 1966, I was born in 66, so I, nothing, I know nothing about it really. Uh, my, my grandfather, the Republican, he, he died the following year. <clears throat> um, so, if I, so if I look in 66, the one thing I do know about 66 is my brother-in-law, who was a Welshman, he came over from 
from Card Card wherever in Wales. He comes from Ogmore Vale, I think he comes from. So he, he came over on a rugby tour, and the date he arrived, they blew up Nelson's column. So uh, and then a few days later, they finished the job. You know, so so he arrived in Ireland. You know, a, a good uh, Protestant boy from the valleys. Uh, he 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 uh, come over, and that day they blew up Nelson's column. Didn't know what's going on. Uh, so that was an interesting experience. I mean, people forget that mm -hmm. that happened then. Um, so uh, back back to you know, moving away from those three uh, links. Um, you know, my I, my grandfather, who was Ronan's and Fiona's grandfather, and lots of others. Um, he he was a died in the wool Republican, and he was very much about you know improving the priv the personal lives of the individual. He was deported at one point for some spurious reason to Australia. Uh, he. Um, he was. He went to the inaugural meeting of the volunteers in Dublin. He he was a, a co-founder of the volunteers in Cork. Um, he 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 was stood on a stage with um, uh, Roger Casement. Um, he was. I mean, he was. He was Rolls Royce Republican. The young, if that's a thing, and and if you if you actually. Look at him. He was only Republican because he was Catholic by chance. His his actual mother was Catholic. His his birth father was Protestant, and the reason that he was brought up Catholic is because when his mother died, the grandmother took over, and I think hid him from and his brother from his Protestant father. Uh, so he is just just Catholic by chance, and if. He wasn't brought up Catholic. He might not have done anything like he did in his life. He wouldn't have formed the IDA. He wouldn't have done any of these things. But that, I mean, that's a strange anomaly uh, in the way he was brought up. And then if you, then if you look at um, his association with uh, Michael Collins and with, uh, with uh, de Valera and how he, he went to the States and he collected money for the Irish cause. I think it was six million pounds, uh, six million dollars he brought back. Well, Granny, Granny Fawcett brought back some of that cash to found the press. So she brought it back in with the, my parents said the, the knitting bag, but flatly I find out it's the knickers. But anyway, <laughs> so she brought back this money back, back to Ireland, to Ireland has founded the the press, which then became that, that newspaper that eventually colla collapsed. Anyway, so, uh, so he's, he's at the start of it then. He gets dragged off to, to London with Barclay and with others uh, to do the, um, the treaty, uh, the treaty um, uh, work. So he was a, just a supporter, really, an auxiliary person, but he was seen as a good guy, so he could go and do this stuff. Uh, and I think he probably added some value, and he met people like uh, Erskine Childers, and there was a, so he was definitely in there. My my mother, um, there were fed, you know, the saving grace for him. My mother, the Protestant, uh, saving grace was that he wouldn't have been a gun carrying uh, IRA man, but it, but he was a gun carrying IRA man. He did have a gun. Uh, he he. There are stories of um, you know being around um, black and tans and being very afraid of being, having a gun in his person and therefore could have been, you know, had to have a confrontation. Whether he'd been, he was a very slight man, uh, or very steady, uh, so he might, have, he might have done quite well. Uh, but uh, regardless of that, he was one. And the elephant in the room in my, my parents' marriage is that he came from a, a Republican back background, a very, very, very solid Republican background. Uh, and she came from a very Protestant landed background. Oh yes, while they had the United Irishmen in the history with Roger O'Connor and Fergus O'Connor, the Chartist and, and the agrarian reformer, uh, you, 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 you felt there was something there that we never really talked about Grandfather Fawcett at all, like ever, although his picture was above, his paint, a painting of him was above the fireplace, but on the other side of the room was a painting of the other great grandfather, who was you know bigger and better painting, uh, <laughs> they probably spent more money on it. Um, <laughs> anyway, and he was Harry Dan, Harry Daniel Connor, who was the first circuit court judge of Cork under the Free State. Uh, 
a, a job that my father took on a good while afterwards because he was, he was the circuit court judge of Cork. Uh, anyway, but the elephant in the room is we never really talked about Fawcett and his goings on. And, you know, my, my father would whisper it in the house, you know, to us. You, know, you do know he was the first Irish consul to the United States. You do know he was this. And, you know, it's not just all the Protestants who are the great nationalist heroes and patriots in your family. Okay, <laughs> well, let's get that down. <laughs> anyway, so so that, was, that, was the, that was the funny bit about dad and mum. But what I didn't know at the time is that the reason mum was so, uh, you know, we didn't really talk about it. And we, oh, the other thing is, at the fireplace, there was pictures, little silhouettes of all of the United Irishmen, every single one. My grandfather collected all of those and went to auctions and bought all of them. So it's a, it's a pretty unique collection, must be worth a fortune. Uh, anyway, so, and you got, you got, you got, uh, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, and you got uh, Roger O'Connor, and you got you got, you got all of them, and your Wolf Tone, and all the rest. You got them all there, and uh, you'd stand in front of the fireplace and you'd talk, because you had that United Irishman at your back. Because you can <laughs> do. Who could who can fail to win an argument? <laughs> you know, with the you'd be pretty warm. That radar was warm, but that fire was hot, uh, and uh, so so that was uh, that was growing up. But the elephant in the room was that. My grand, my, Harry Dan, who was the first um, circuit court judge of Fork, his sister was married to a first a cousin uh, called George O'Connor, and he was a major in the British Army, and, and uh, he was seventy years old. He was a DJ, and um, on the eve of the truce, nineteen twenty-one, because he was on a list, he was taken from his bed, and he was shot. And he was then branded as a an informer. But what I didn't know was, and I knew this, how, and my mother used to explain, ah, oh, but these really brave men, they rode out to Hop Island and they shot him. And so she didn't think that was a patriotic thing to do on the eve of the treaty and um, of the truce. When everything was, should have been calming down and settling down, we were going to get a treaty. There would be a resolution to this war of independence. And I'll, I'll say this now, there is no minimum viable plan that anybody has for a war of independence. A war of independence, you don't know where you are in the journey. You don't know how to start it and you don't know how you will exit it. In, in IT, we talk about minimal viable. So we say, absolutely, this is all you have to do to achieve your objective. But people didn't know that. They didn't know what the minimum viable plan for independence was. They didn't know what they needed to do. And similar, there is no guidebook in, in creating a state. So the people who were actually taking on the job of creating the free state had no real, you know, here's the penguin book of free statesmanship. You, did, did, you couldn't take it out and say, this is how we get there. So everybody was doing this for the very first time. So back to my back to my parents and my mother going, your father was the founder of the group that went out and shot my uncle. So why would they talk about, mm -hmm. uh, why would they talk about mm -hmm. the great patriot Fawcett? Which he was, it, it was without, without any doubt he was a patriot. But similarly, people on the Connor side were also patriots. And this is the incongruous bit. Why on earth would not people know that Major O'Connor was a direct descendant, not indirect, not a nephew, not a distant cousin, a direct descendant of Roger O'Connor, the United Irishman. Yet he was taken from his bed, and five months earlier, his wife was, was also shot when they were trying to get him. So both, both blood relatives were uh, shot. So I grew up in this house where my father was a, a duty-bound guy, and he was, a, he, was a, he was a judge. And he was a great, good friend of Jack Lynch's, and Jack Lynch appointed, appointed him to that special court called the Special Criminal Court, um, because Jack knew there was going to be trouble. And, and he knew he could count on Tommy Doyle, he could, he could count on Liam Hamilton, he could count on oh, um, Sean. Um, and uh, so dad had a sequence of horrible 
IRA trials that he had to deal with. You know, he had the Mountbatten trial. He had um, Mad Dog McGlinchey uh, extradition trial. He had he had all of them. So we were we, we grew up in a very strange house because you know we had security. There was a caravan in 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 the in the, in the garden. And uh, we, you know, as two policemen, one with a machine gun, one with a pistol, that'd be correct, wouldn't it? And and uh, we used to play cards. Myself and my little sister, we used to play card for coppers, with the coppers. <laughs> and and, and uh, it, it, it was it was it was great fun. But you know, we didn't think anything of it really, as children. That you know, but we did get the occasional death threat phone call. I picked up one myself or two, and uh, yeah, that was that was his juicy in keeping the free state, the republic as it was then, going. Um, and, uh, you know, so we had the protection all the time. In the, and then when the circuit, when the special criminal stopped, car stopped, the police would go. Because mm -hmm. that's what he wanted. He didn't want to be surrounded by police. He didn't, he didn't want that. Um, anyway, I, I'm digressing a little bit. So that was, that was our childhood. So like <laughs> Bernard, I grew up, uh, I was taught at home, um, but, and, and I learned nothing because I was not a very good student. And uh, I went to sixth class in Balneen. Um, so I went to sixth class, and that's where I learned everything that I know, really. I learned how to do maths, and that maths is, my, is, 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 is what saved me, really, from being completely average, uh, which I am anyway, but you know, just anyway. So, um, so I'd learned all of that in, in Balneen and moved, moved from, from there. I was sent to secondary school. So I was went from this home life where, where I was taught at home, was completely free. We'd do anything we liked. There was no, no structure. And, um, and then to a, a primary school, which was very Catholic, you know, I learned prayers I never learned before, you know, half and half. We weren't going to be saying the rosary. In, and, you know, the Angelus comes on, we want to turn that off. Anyway, so... Uh, because you know, it's time for the news is what the Angelus was. Uh, anyway, so, um, and then, uh, so I went to secondary school, went to a convent. And what, what was really clear is that all my social friends, the tennis players we played with, etc., the band hall that we'd go to, was all Protestant. Never really realized there was a difference there. And then when we went to secondary school, we went to, to a convent and, you know, and then I'd take the bus and the bus between Manche would go all over the bloody countryside to get to the Manway via Kilmichael. So what's gone on here then? Anyway, and only laterally in my life did I find out that actually Dunmanway in Balning has a, has a pretty shocking history around uh, what was a pogrom, where neighbours that I knew growing up, you know, like the Bushermers and the Bradfields, etc., that they were, you know, it was 13 deaths murders in the space of, you know, two or three days in, 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 in not pre the treaty, not pre the ceasefire, but post the treaty, pre the election in June. So in these days in April, there, a list had been made to go after loyalists, and they were all Protestant, of course, and, and in that very sports, short period of time, a plan that was was executed to kill as many as they could. Um, now you say, was that was that in the minimal viable plan to set up a free stage, to have a republic? Was that necessary to suppress an insurgency, an insurgency that we would have thought might come like you'd have in Iraq or wherever, in Ireland, or was it something else? I don't I don't really know, but I, I can't you know to this day I can't really see what military benefit was taken from, from killing my uncle on the eve of the truce and then killing these people pre, pre um, these neighbors, Protestant neighbors, families that I know, uh, pre the election. But remember, there was a pact for the election in, in 1922 that said, you know, we're all Sinn Feiners. And that's my grandfather's side, you know. So, it's just a very strange circumstance. The people are in Downing and Dunman, we are fabulous people. They're really warm, giving people, but they're cautious. Mm. They don't really talk about it. And the question I would have for everybody is, is, is really, well, at what point did a person in Dunman, in Downing, think that they could go to the front door without having fear? 
and an isolated farm that they didn't have to have watch their fields and be careful. At what, what point in this nation's history did a, they go to the marsh and look over there and say, was it one of them who came from my grandfather? Yeah. You just don't know. And, and, and I'll say it, this is very, the, the three of you are very brave to talk about this. I mean, I've got the protection of my fabulous Republican history. Um, uh, to talk about this when we know that Protestants in, in the South don't talk about this. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, very powerful from all of you, but a very poignant um, ending to that sort of phase of our discussion. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your courage and bravery. Um, would you believe it? We have been going for well over an hour and 15 minutes, nearly an hour and 20. Um, so with your permission, maybe another 15, 20 minutes max. And then I think that'll be enough, if that's okay. Um, um, so, th I mean, there <clears throat> a number of things strike me. I mean, not least the unsaid, the, the, the sense of emotion. Um, and we are over a hundred years further on, and yet somehow in this room, you can really feel an emotion from that time today. Um, that's very striking. But I think today is not the day to unravel that, but it's really palpable, and I'm sure most of you agree that it's there. Um, perhaps one thing, there could be a number of themes. I mean, Ida, you mentioned myths. I'm really struck by the complexity of each individual, each of you and your family history and the mix and the hybridness, and there's so many themes we could unravel, which we don't have time for, but which does point to you know, how these conversations are useful and hopefully there'll be more. But maybe just something more, if you can, and, and feel free to speak or not, on the silence or the I have to hide myself or is it really safe to be open about who I am, what it is that makes me me or my family who we are? Because I think if I've heard anything, that it's the silence, the unknown, the when's it safe to be open, peace. Um, so we don't have long, but if, if you've got more to say on that subject, that I think that would be interesting just to hear more about, if that's okay, um, before we sort of tie up. So as you feel comfortable to come in. Um, Maybe I'll kick off then just to make it more random. <laughs> <laughs> um, in West Cork, and I come with two ads. I have the person joining, and of course, I have the, the public persona as pastor to a number of thousand people in the county. And in the context of the decade of centenaries, I was very conscious that we should do something uh, because otherwise um, we would only collude in the ongoing silence. So we created. Uh, um, our own diocese, and we were the only diocese to do it, uh, Satini's Commemoration and Reconciliation Program, which has been running for about 10 years. And it was about getting people engaged and involved and trying to empower them to tell their stories. But four years ago, there was a political speech in Don Manway, as it happens, and it was asserted that the age of silence is over, and I disagreed vigorously on it that. Uh, I said it to the politician concerned, and I said it when we went, uh, we, I think we're the only church to seek a meeting with the expert advisory group, and we went and had a meeting, and uh, I, I made that statement. And I still believe very strongly the age of silence is not over. And I know that, I know that from my own experience of trying to organize what we would do in the centenaries of uh, the killings in the Bandon Valley, uh, or the centenary of which was April last year. I know it because different parishes reacted in different ways to the idea. I know it because it took me four or five years to get that engagement. 
Um, and it, it, it ended up that, you know, I was getting, I had all the clergy in the, and the parish committees involved in, in trying to get the measure of it, giving priority to the descendants uh, and so on, hearing what they wanted. And I was getting messages like, for instance, there's one from one parish, tell the bishop to leave well and all. Hmm. Tell the bishop to leave well and all. It was a very strong message from one part of West Cork. Um, and uh, then from others, well, we'd like something, but we'll, we'll just go ourselves and the bishop can come and not in that headstone that was on that unmarked, never on that unmarked grave, but we don't want any publicity. Now, this is last year. <laughs> yeah, this is last year. Yeah. You know, and you're talking about the name of a 16-year-old who was killed in that period, going on a headstone, a family headstone. His name had been left off the family headstone. And what was that? Was he a secondary target rather than the prime Well, one doesn't know, you see. I, as I often said to Ivan, I'm not a historian, so I don't engage with the historiography. <laughs> as again, it's part of my thing, I suppose it's pastoral thing. The only thing that interests me is, is not the only thing. I'm very interested in the historiography. But my primary interest is in, in the human fallout, deaths, suffering, and my real focus is what is Ireland today and what can we become today? And so therefore, therefore, in that period, I wanted to give people the opportunity to end the silence. That's really the point I want to make. Mm. And one parish took it and managed to do something about ending the silence. Other parishes didn't feel able to do so and so on. So all I'm really saying is it's still a big issue, and the age of silence is not over. In my experience, as recently as Austin, yeah. yeah, I carted work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I suppose um, to add to that, Paul um, very kindly invited me onto the Church of Ireland Decade of Centenaries Committee, which was doing really sensitive work to look at those issues and to look at several different aspects of commemoration nationwide. And our our committee is all island. So, you know, it is a really sensitive thing. And sometimes I would get a little look where I'd be told now, moderate that a little bit. And because you have to, it was a very interesting thing to do, Paul, I think, uh, without breaking any of the confidences of the committee, because we came from very different perspectives and, and angles. And uh, it taught me a lot um, because I came from this quite, I suppose, um, sheltered background. Uh, I'd gone to a pro um, Quaker school in Waterford and my parents didn't even want me to go to another Church of Ireland school because they thought, um, and you know, it was probably quite a good idea in the 70s um, to have that Quaker influence at the time, I think was quite beneficial to growing up and getting a more open um, look at life. And the Church of Ireland can be quite, um, well, in that time, you know, you had a lot of the panels on the walls were commemorations of battles and soldiers. And I had many, like, like the rest of you, I had a granduncle who died, a beloved granduncle who died in, in the First World War. Not that I loved him then, I'm not that old. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but my grandmother's brother and my father, actually, as a little story, was, was named after him, which is a lovely thing, except he was called King. And my father was born in 1919 in the new coming Ireland and had to grow up with the name King. <laughs> so he had to become very interested in all things Irish, I think, to make himself easier. Um, but this idea, I've also lived in the North for a while. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place now. The, 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 I lived in Belfast for four years as well. And that brought me not only in touch with um, some friends who uh, would have worked in the Irish press with my, my ex-husband, uh, who were quite nationalist. And um, I got to learn about their lives and who they were. But I also, you know, met my colleagues in Queens, went out to, you know, uh, with my friend Alwyn, who played the piano, you know Alwyn as well. And um, so I played the organ in church, went out to her church community and met them. So I've done a lot of talking and listening in the North as well. And I think it's not just silence, but listening. And you do a huge amount of listening. And I know you do a huge amount of private listening as well that we'll never hear about. So I'm just ratting on you on that for a little bit here. <laughs> and, you know, it's not all very public things that you do. 
and that we all need to do these. And I think I have one expression. Um, I was on a panel with um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Mary McAleese and David McWilliams. And little me, you know, I was a nobody there. And, uh, but the one point they really wanted me to make was that I feel very strongly that whatever stance we have, whatever angle we have, whatever perspective we have, that we all, in order to make this island a better place, need to shift our foot a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, a little bit forwards, a little bit backwards, to accommodate and to help and to mm -hmm. integrate. And we need also to understand, and I think Bernard, this is where you will probably give me a little kiss in the cheek afterwards, mm -hmm. is we need to understand <laughs> that this island will not be completely green. That we have to allow, not only for unionism uh, in some way um, to accommodate it, uh, but we also have to understand for the new Ireland um, with the new populations that are coming in. And um, I think they're quite wonderful because I think they're forcing us to self-analyse. You know, different is not traveller or Protestant. It's other things too now. And um, I remember a story, uh, just to finish on, that a, a, a great friend of mine, um, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me naming her name, but maybe I better not. Her son, um, she was Indian, of Indian origin, and her son was playing in the local GA team where I was living at the time. And he came home and he said, Mom, there was some black, and I won't say the other word, on the other team. And he was at so-and-so. Uh, he was really nasty tackling me was what he meant. And uh, my friend said, you know, son, some people might look at you and think you were the black so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. you know, I've been called um, names in my times, but I always try to deal them as a Protestant. I'd always try to deal with them with humour and to just treat back that way. And I think we all need to remember a sense of humour about a lot of this too. And, you know, it's come through in all our engagement here today mm. for all the fact mm. that we're dealing with very difficult things. Mm. So there. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, I don't really have a huge amount to, to add. Um, you know, over the last few years, I've been working very closely with uh, a group of, of descendants who are involved with um, you know, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and we've we've moved forward into these conversations, which is which is wonderful. It's because it's, it's bigger than it's bigger than just the treaty. The treaty was a moment in time and it was a gateway. Um, the one thing that 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 I probably should add is, is that. My grandfather, J.L.F. Uh, Fawcett, uh, Dermot Fawcett, uh, when the Republic was born, he, he, he thought that was a mistake. He thought that that was populist and actually a, a, a step, a misstep in the journey to a greater Ireland. That if you were actually looking for a greater Ireland, an Ireland that was more inclusive and whatever, you actually needed to recognize that, you know, that in the same way as Brexit uh, has, uh, has created problems, that people have lost identity uh, by taking that layer away. Uh, you know, whatever that layer is, um, if British people had European citizenship, they no longer have it. Um, it was an emotional identity for uh, Protestants, Unionists in the South. And while, uh, as my mother would have said, the, the link was there, there, was, there wasn't a problem. And, and when the uh, Republic has formed, and God knows, uh, nobody uh, <laughs> with the Republic of Bangladesh would ever thought that was a negative. But the, the negative side of it was actually that link was broken, and uh, therefore that journey to a greater world was going to be a lot longer and a lot harder. And that was his opinion, and he was a Republican. Interesting. What? Um, oh, but all I want to say is I'm looking into the audience, looking at all the people I've worked with for the last um, two years nearly now. It's the first time I heard silence. I knew all about it, but the first time I heard anybody articulating it to an orator was Ronan at, at the UCC conference and trans transgenerational trauma. I actually was not conscious of that until I heard you, Ronan, talking about this. And, and I see the descendants of the Bolands, Cal Brewer, O'Higgins, Collins, you know, sitting in this room together. I have great hope for the future. 
Uh, and I you know, kind of wish, and as I'm sure we all did, that the kind of friendship we've formed, um, um, you know, was something which could have prevented the war. Um, yeah. So, so we we have yeah we 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 have hope, and of course, um, the ladies have been the ladies have been great in all this, Fiona and Ida, and um, I just I, I just think I have of serious hope that we are today is part of a process of ending the silence that Paul is talking about. It's not over, but we we're making a good start. I think we're making a good start on this today, and. Um, uh, in that regard, my own little personal contribution um, was um, t to go. Uh, the, I, I was appointed to the High Court in April, March, nineteen twenty fourteen, and I was the first judge to go to um, the War Memorial Service uh, at the Four Courts since nineteen thirty one. I think that's absolutely disgraceful, it, but it actually somebody had to do it. And I went there and I'm pleased to be able to say everybody, now, it, you know, that started something going. The Bar Council have taken over the thing and it's now an official event. And in, in, in 2018, uh, through my own contact with fellow members of the judiciary in the North, I managed to get the Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland and the Court of Appeal Judge, uh, Ben Stevenson, to come to our little um, ceremony uh, at the Four Courts in 1918 because that was the 100th anniversary at the end of the war and there's about 22 names there of barristers on unionist and national that's the other thing which i like about the memorial you know really strong they were known as really strong you know home rulers their names are there beside men who are equally determined unionists and they're all fighting to fought and died together and i like to think that together we'll build something and um so i got an invitation um, from the Lord Chief Justice to go to do a return visit to Northern Ireland and Covid wrecked that and, uh, and he also met a lot of opposition. There were quite a lot of people. He said, you know, we have a long way to go in the North and the, the, the communities are still split and, you know, we're now talking about the bar. You know, we're talking about an educated part of the community. And he said, it's going to take a little while to get into the idea that people like you are coming from them to join in on our ceremony. And that didn't happen, actually, until 2021, when the new Lady Chief Justice of Northern Ireland uh, followed through on our predecessor's thing. So I went, I did a little bit of research for this. And I discovered that um, the last time uh, the benchers of the King's Age, who represent the bar, really, in Ireland, had been represented at this ceremony to mark the Great War Dead was 1926. I was the first person to go there since 1926. And I, I, I laid a wreath at that memorial and I couldn't believe the reaction afterwards, the number of people. Now, literally all lawyers, you know, but solicitors and barristers, and I dare say a good lot of them, unionists, came up to me and said, let me, they made it absolutely clear how much they appreciated the fact that somebody had actually come from the South and had actually participated at this level. But the 2021 20, it took before this happened. So it, it, it's kind of very slow. And uh, the good news is, folks, that it's all now on an annual official basis. And this exchange every year is going to take place every year. And um, um, the ch chairman of the, the, the Dean of Court and the chairman of the Bar Council, they, they were invited to come down here in July to go to the Island Bridge, where Kevin O'Higgins had actually a hand in, in yeah, and I know his granddaughter is here. Uh, he, had a, he had a hand uh, in, 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 in that project being brought to fruition. Um, and they came to that, and uh, they were very warmly received. And it was really hand across the border and trying to understand one another. So. Yeah, the silence is, is it's dissipating. And, and today, I think we've made a, made a really good place with that. But, you know, uh, Kevin O'Higgins lost a brother in the First World War. And although he supported the memorial, he said it would make him a bit upset 
if people would associate this memorial with the fight for freedom, he said they'd nothing to do with it. So even somebody like him was basically wanting to make it the distinction that basically, you know, these Irish were really different. And it came out on an RTE program just the other night. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it's the program about the security arrangements that were put in place to try to, to pry an event when the Queen's visit came on to try and prevent something happening. It's an amazing program. It's all about, you know. But in the in the course of that program they were talking for of course about the Queen's visit to Island Bridge. Uh, not Island Bridge but to uh, the Warrant Museum. And the commentator was uh, talking about you know, the memorial to our glorious dead. And no mention whatsoever of Island Bridge or so it's in it's absolutely it's in the DNA. This this separation and is an exclusion is still in the DNA and is still being perpetrated this very week. And really that's what we have to struggle about. So um yeah, so it would have been a balanced programme had to say that the next day the Queen went to Island Bridge to remember the fifty thousand Irish that didn't come home, but there's no mention of it. Mm. So anyway, look folks, I just I we ha there's hope. There's hope, there's hope, there's hope for us all. And I think that we'll get forward and we will, we will build, we'll help to build an Ireland in which we'll, we'll all share. And I, I think that's a very apt moment at which to finish, um, that despite a very painful past and legacy, there is hope. Um, so thank you for offering that, Bernard. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and witnessing and partaking um, and being in support of um, our four primary participants. So that's much appreciated and for uh, making the effort to come to Glen Cree. Um, and I, I'm really struck by two things. I mean, I could say a lot, but I won't. Um, I, I am struck by a sense of courage um, from all four of you that, you know, silence does still exist, but it is now, it's now, a hundred years is quite long enough, thanks very much, and now this time is to play your part in breaking that down. And of course there are others, so, but I am struck by that courage. And I'm really struck actually by the symbol of the sort of treaty generation descendants group and how you can have, to take your words, Richard, Royals, Royce Republicans, with people from sitting together with some very different backgrounds who would have really disagreed with each other, be that Southern Unis or different versions of Republican or different f dreams of what Ireland would become. Uh, and that's sort of really sprung out today for me um, um, and certainly points to the need for further discussions to broaden that understanding and make black and white become a lot grayer and I really think you've made a valuable contribution, all four of you, for that. Um, but there are some hard questions. Richard asked a couple of hard questions. Mm -hmm. And we mustn't shy away from them if we can ask them, as you did, Richard, in a, in a sort of, it, with a spirit of curiosity and I want to understand, not a, and I now want you to sort of be somehow punished or for that. Um, we, 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 we do have to grapple with some difficult stuff. Dun Manway is one of sadly far too many on the island in the last hundred years where we've had that sort of very uncomfortable targeting of people and killings. Um, so Richard, Paul, Ida, Bernard, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.